So, so far there have been quite a lot of developments and rules changes in Nine. Today I thought we'd put everything that we know so far all together in one video. Hello and welcome back to Warspec Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel where we're all about getting the most out of our miniatures on the tabletop. We've been covering all the rules changes from 9th edition over the last few weeks, and in all honesty I've been quite surprised by just how far Games Workshop has gone in terms of changing very different aspects of the game. A lot of it very much seems like improvements, some things I think are a little bit more questionable, but there seem to be quite a few rules that are pulling in different directions, either say making melee armies stronger or weaker at the same time. I thought to shed a little bit of clarity, we'd put all the rules leaks that we have together in one video to try and get a bit more of a handle on what a game of 9th edition 40k is likely to look like. Let's get straight into it. So to start with, I thought we'd talk about the various changes that aren't directly relevant to a turn of 40k. Incidentally, if you want to see any of these slides, I was planning on posting them on the Orspets Tactics Facebook group when this video comes out. So feel free to head over there and give it a like, and you can also have these little summaries as well if you want them. In any case, command points have been heavily reshuffled, detachments now cost command points rather than generating them, a battalion will cost you 3 command points unless it happens to have your warlord in, in which case a battalion, patrol or brigade will be free. Battleforged armies at 2000 points will start with 12 command points, and it will scale depending on the size of the game that you're playing. You also get 1 command point per turn in the command phase. The minimum table size has decreased from 72 by 48 inches to 44 by 60 inches should you want to play a game of 40k on smaller tables. It looks like a lot of the major tournaments are going to be adopting to this new size, so I suspect that it will become more and more prevalent throughout the community, though there will be some pushback from everyone already having the standard size tables that we have at the moment. This will likely mean that more guns are in range, there's less room to screen, and less room to run away from melee armies. Although it looks like from the missions, they'll be still setting up as far away from each other as they were before. Talking of missions, the game's workshop missions have been heavily redone, you will have a primary mission objective, and you'll also be able to select secondary missions from a list of various different charts, being able to pick one secondary from each chart. Some of them will reward killing enemy units, some of them will reward being in certain objectives or table quarters, and there's going to be 18 primary missions in the book, I believe 6 for the 2000 point mark missions. Certain units will be able to do actions in game, which means they sacrifice either shooting or moving or using other abilities to score victory points on objectives. There are going to be 7 core stratagems in the book, rather than the 3 that we have before. The command reroll, the auto pass melee and interrupting in the fight phase. We know 3 more of them so far, which I cut them down, want to give mortal wounds when you fall away from big units of infantry. Overwatch, which has become a stratagem rather than an innate ability, and you have to pay a command points to allow a unit to do it. And desperate breakout for 2 command points to allow a unit to fall back from being wrapped or tri-pointed. There's one more that we don't know of yet, we might find that out soon. It could either be a strategic reserve stratagem, maybe an ability to allow monsters to fight units on upper floors of ruins, but so far it's not confirmed. Finally, we have points changes to every single unit in the game, pretty much exclusively going up. I guess we'll find out if any select units do go down. So basically it means that 2000 point games will be very slightly smaller than before. We've seen previews for a few units, including Intercessors that have gone up to 20 points, Cultists to 6 points, and Necrons to 12. We will have to see just how much everything else goes up to really judge how good those changes are though. In terms of changes to the in-game rules and the turn sequence, there's been quite a shake-up. First of all, there's a new command phase where you gain that one command point per turn of yours, and you'll also be able to do certain faction-specific abilities. I suspect things like chaplain litanies or other things that happen at the start of the turn will happen in this phase. For the movement phase, of course, we have desperate breakout and the cut them down stratagem that will both take effect in this phase. We've got strategic reserves where you can pay command points to put your units in reserves and progressively throughout the game they'll be able to move on on different table edges. They have confirmed that if you bring them in within your own deployment zone they'll be able to set up right next to enemy units, potentially leading to very short charges for melee units. Flyers can fly off the board now and return in a later turn, obviously sacrificing a shooting phase. For the shooting phase, blast weapons are a major shake-up that's going to really punish hordes and larger infantry squads. You'll get a minimum of 3 shots with any blast weapons against units with 6 or more models in them, and this means that D3 weapons will always be firing on max shots versus these, whereas all blast weapons will be firing on max shots versus units with 11 or more models, which is a massive buff to D6 weapons, essentially changing them into heavy 6 guns. Blast weapons will be applied via an index of rules, and they're going to be nominating around about 170 weapons to gain the blast keyword. Now non-infantry such as bikers and vehicles can move and fire with heavy weapons at no penalty, which will certainly be useful for things like land speeders or attack bikes, and make any backfield armour far more mobile. Vehicle and monsters will be able to fire their weapons in melee, with a minus one to hit penalty if those weapons are heavy, and they won't be able to do so with blasts, so screening will still be necessary for certain vehicles. 
The character targeting rules have changed quite a bit. The new lookout sir rule means that they'll only be able to be screened from enemy firepower if they're within three inches of a vehicle, monster, or unit with three or more models in. This will mean that you're just that little bit more able to focus down enemy characters and they won't be able to hide when they're completely out in the open now. They've clarified that modifiers don't stack, certainly for hit roll modifiers in the shooting phase. So defensively, all you're going to be able to require is a plus or minus one to hit at max, although we haven't seen the full rules of this yet, so it's going to be interesting whether it's just hit roll modifiers or various other modifiers to wounds or saving throws or something. We have some new terrain rules, both obscuring cover and dense cover. Obscuring cover is basically a ruins rule, where anything that isn't 18 wounds or bigger or has the aircraft keyword won't be able to be shot if you're directly behind a ruin on the other side of them. And dense cover means that we'll be getting a minus one to hit on any of the same units if they're either in that dense cover or every model in their unit is at least partially obscured by it. In the charge phase, Overwatch not being a universal ability, now it's a stratagem, means that a lot of more fragile close combat units will be making it in combat with very big units very easily. Although on the flip side, multi-charges have been nerfed because of this. You now need to be able to engage every single unit that you declare the charge on. You can't just nominate everything and then only make a charge to the nearest one. That might hamper things like big Death Star close combat units a bit. After charging units of fought, it's now going to be the player who's not made any charges this turn who nominates the next unit to fight rather than the attacker, making it remaining in combat just a little bit riskier against them. We also know that certain monsters are going to be able to engage units in higher floors of ruins than they were before, although it's not clarified yet. And defensible terrain, which ruins happen to be, can now allow defenders to gain a 5 plus overwatch or plus 1 hit roll in the fight phase if they're manning the ruins. Finally, in the morale phase, things are apparently going to be a bit less all or nothing, with either your entire squad running or none of them, but we don't have any details as to how that's changed as of yet. The game's going to be adding a whole new narrative game mode, the Crusade game mode, where you'll start with drawing up an order of battle at 50 power level, and this can be taken from any of the greater alliances in the 40k world, either Imperium, Chaos, or Eldar for example. Each game that you play will pick units from this roster, and this roster can expand through requisition points, or you can add more units to this force. There'll be missions written specifically for the Crusade mode, where you can gain these requisition points, and these missions can also give you certain rewards for accomplishing specific objectives, such as being able to find extra technology, and certain of your units can gain battle honours and level of experiences for which you can pick useful abilities for them. If units get injured or damaged, then they might acquire battle scars, which can be healed for requisition points, which will be penalties to their stat line and abilities in-game. They've previewed one of the relics that you can use, which is Xenotech lasers, which is basically a mortal wound firing pistol for one of your commanders to carry. Your characters and squads will carry over from game to game, so your army will level up and gain experience as you carry on, but you can still play crusade game modes against match play armies, who will get some command points to compensate for the various bits of technology and extra abilities that you've acquired for your crusade force, so in theory it should be at least fairly balanced. They'll be telling us how to play Crusade in the ninth rulebook and have some generic abilities such as the ones previewed, but we'll get some more faction-specific Crusade content when their actual codexes come out, with things like your Space Marine characters being able to become Dreadnoughts and things. Finally, we've had an absolute ton of new rules shown off for the Space Marines and Necrons. On the Space Marine side, we're getting Assault Intercessors, who are going to be armed with Astartes Chainswords, which are going to be somehow better in melee than standard ones, them having hinted at AP-1 for them, though it could be something else. We have Gravis Armoured Eradicators with Melter Weapons that are going to be longer range, Blade Guard Veterans with Storm Shields and Mastercrafted Power Swords, which will be usable by the Deathwing for Dark Angels, and there's an ancient version of them as well for a Banner Bearer. We've seen most of the stat line for the Primaris Outriders, very sturdy bikers with an enormous amount of tax on the charge and four wounds at toughness five apiece. The Outriders also have an invader in the same style, which basically looks a bit like a dune buggy and has some twin bolt rifles and also an onslaught gatling cannon or a multi-melter. There's a new chaplain variant known as the Judiciar, who looks to be a bit of a melee combat character who's going to be particularly good at laying low enemy champions. We have a fire strike servo turret packing either twin accelerated auto cannons or a last talon, and the captain lieutenants from the Indomitus box who both have mastercrafted power swords and storm shields. In addition, we might also see the flyer or land speeder that we saw teased in those grainy images earlier in the year alongside the Primaris Outriders, which does make me think that it's likely going to be coming fairly soon. On the Necron side of things, there's even more new units, new warriors that can be equipped with a shorter range, strength 5, AP-2, Gauss Reaper, Scorpec Destroyers carrying Hyperphase Reap Blades, which look like they're going to be fast, durable, anti-elite melee units, a Scorpec Lord armed with an Enmitic Annihilator, likely going to be buffing the Scorpec Destroyers, a Royal Warden, which is an immortal-like minor HQ character similar to a Lieutenant, 
a Plasmancer variant of Cryptek, who will provide some useful buffs, the Reanimator and Doomstalker, War of the World style walkers, one of which is very much a repair functioned machine, though it does have some ranged damage output, and the other one packs a Doomsday weapon. A new monolith armed with various different weapon options, where it can replace those Gauss Flux arcs with what looks like Tesla weapons, I believe. Locust Heavy Destroyers done in the same style as the old destroyers, but massively upscaled and armed with either an enormous Gauss weapon or an Enmitic weapon. New models for Scarab Swarms, and a mysterious assassin looking character that was skulking behind a monolith in a preview picture. Mr. Zarek, the Silent King himself, resplendent on a throne with two shield creations hovering in front of him a new Overlord in the Indomitus box, and a Luminor Seraz who will technically be coming out with Pariah slightly before the main Necron release. The new Codex is going to be very early in 9th, and it's going to have at least three new Necron dynasties in there, and I've said that they've reworked reanimation protocols to work a little bit differently, though I haven't told us quite how yet. So quite a lot of changes on the way for 9th edition then, I think we're really starting to get the full picture a bit more now, obviously everything could change a fair bit with points costs, but I think we're really starting to get a handle on how this new game is going to be played. Like I said, if you'd like to see any of these slides, then feel free to head over to the Auspex Tactics Facebook page, where I'll be posting them as well. The link is down in the video description below. If you'd like to see more coverage of the ninth rules as they come out, feel free to subscribe to the channel, where we'll be continuing to piece together the rules as they come in one by one. Finally, if you would like to help support the channel, I'd just like to mention the Auspex Tactics Patreon page, where you can also see new videos slightly early, take part in regular polls to see what sort of videos come next for the channel, and there's regular prize draws at the start of each month, where we're going to be giving away three copies of the Indomitus box set in August, given to random patrons, chosen with a random number generator, with one ticket for each dollar pledged towards the channel. If any of that sounds good to you, then feel free to give a look at the link in the video description down below. And in any case, a massive thank you for watching. I'll hope to see you guys next time.